1989, a cave was discovered in the province of Lorestan in Iran. The cave became known as Kalmakara Cave. In those mountains in the far, you can see a crack in the middle of the mountains. And that's where the cave is located. This cave is extremely difficult to get into because it is right in the middle of a cliff and there is a 15 meter dive. You need equipments and ropes to be able to get inside. And inside this cave, they discovered more than 180 treasures. They included statues of animals and humans, jewelries, all made of silver and gold. They also discovered plates and also masks made of gold. The objects in this cave dated back to 700 BC to 800 BC. Kalmakara Cave and all the objects inside of it became known as the world's sixth treasure. My goal in this video is to find out who put these artifacts inside this cave and why, and how they remained hidden for more than 2600 years. Stay tuned. As we look at some of the objects and artifacts in this cave, we realize that there are inscriptions on some of them. These ancient inscriptions are in three main languages. The Aramaic language, the New Assyrian cuneiform, and the Elamite cuneiform. Let's talk about the Aramaic. The Aramaic was the main language of the Aramean kingdoms. But the Arameans were far away from Zagros. What was their language doing here on these objects? It dates back to the times of Tiglath-Pileser, the emperor of the Assyrian Empire. Tiglath was mass deporting the Arameans to different locations in the Middle East. His strategy was to prevent them from rebellions and revolt against the empire. So about 30,000 Arameans were mass deported to Zagros, sometimes in between 750 BC to 700 BC. When they were brought to Zagros, their language was adopted by the local people. And that's how it appears on some of these objects in this cave. By far the most common inscriptions on these artifacts is the Elamite cuneiform. And that is no surprise because this area was the realm of the Elamites. However, the names that appear on the artifacts do not represent any Elamite king. So the language is the Elamite cuneiform, but the names are not Elamites. And that's where the mystery begins. In the ancient times, migrations to Zagros was very common. At around 800 BC, a migration happened from Caucasus to Zagros. It was a very small kingdom called Somatora, and they were most likely Indo-Europeans. And these people were not fully civilized. They invaded villages and they looted everything and they left but after they arrived to Zagros they fell in love with the culture of Elam and they even adopted the Elamite language because they had no handwriting system of their own the names of the kings that appear on the objects and artifacts of Kalmakara cave belong to this kingdom, the kingdom of Somatora. The phrases are written on the inner edge of these jars and they are very small and extremely difficult to read. 
The middle jaw reads Unsikitashi, the son of Ampirish. The jaw on the right reads Ampirish, the son of Dobala. Here are the names of the kings of Somatora, starting from the founder at the top, Dabal or Tabal. The next one is Ampirish. Now Ampirish appears on many of the objects of this cave. Next one is Unsikitashi, Sapirik and Anasapon. The kingdom of Somatora made peace with the Elamites and the kingdom of Elam. However, apparently they did not make peace with the Assyrians. And quite to the contrary, they allied with the Medes and the Elamites against the Assyrians. And that sets up the background for the next part of this video. We want to answer the second question. Why were these objects and artifacts brought to this cave and why they remained hidden for the next 2600 years? I am now going towards the village of Golgo, about 20 kilometers south of Elam. And in that ancient Iranian village, there are some clues about what happened in Kalmakare. So we take this road and then we have to walk a little bit into the mountains. And right on the rocks, the Assyrian Empire has left a rock relief and inscription. It's about three meters above the ground and it's been covered by the Iranian government to prevent people from writing their names and phone numbers on these ancient rock reliefs. But I'm just going to stick my hands in there and take some images and videos the Iranian way. At first, there's nothing particularly interesting. But as we look closely on the top, we can spot an image. The image is not very clear, so I'm just going to borrow the original photo from 1973. On the black and white picture, you can see a moon and two stars above it. And you can easily spot that on my image. But on the right, there is the image of an Assyrian soldier wearing a hamlet. That's not very easy to spot unless you have strong eyes. I'm just gonna zoom in into his ear. But more important than the image is the inscription. On this rock there is a message written in the Assyrian cuneiform language and it dates back to 670 BC. It was written by an Assyrian king named Esaradun. During the reign of Esaradon, the Assyrians defeat the kingdom of Egypt and they make Egypt a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire. During his reign, the Assyrian Empire reaches its greatest extent. Esaradon doesn't really take any military actions in the east, but he does come to Zagros bringing a message, a message of peace, or maybe a sticks and carrot policy. For the Assyrians and the great gods who stood and overcame them in favor of their beloved king, Marduk has given me a wide vision and a deep understanding. Jumping to the second paragraph, Esaradon directs his message to the people of Zagros. I should write this stone to encourage future kings and sons to be a prince among the kings of my sons, who will nominate him to be Assyria and the great gods to rule the land and the people. So this message is more like an invitation. He is encouraging all the people of Zagros, including the Elamites, the Sumatora, the Medes, and everyone else 
to come under the control of Assyria and do not cause disturbance, do not engage in revolts and rebellions, do not invade the Assyrians. Everyone accept me as the king of the kings. Although Esaradon came to Zagros with a message of peace, Many of the kingdoms and the tribes in Zagros do not listen. That includes the Medes and the Elamites. And even in the north, the kingdom of Urarto, and in the northwest, the Cimmerians, they keep causing problems for the Assyrian Empire. So Esaradon dies and his son Ashurbanipal comes to power. And Ashurbanipal doesn't even waste any time. He engages in his Styx policy. He invades the Elamites. He goes straight to the city of Susa and he burns it down. Ashur Banipal writes about his invasion of Elam in the Assyrian text. He writes, Susa, the great holy city, abode of their gods, seed of their mysteries, I conquered. I entered its palaces. I opened their treasuries where silver and gold, goods and wealth were amassed. I destroyed the ziggurat of Susa. I smashed its shining copper horns. I reduced the temples of Elam to naught. Their gods and goddesses I scattered to the winds. The tombs of their ancient and recent kings I devastated. I exposed to the sun and carried away their bones toward the land of Asur. I devastated the provinces of Elam, and on their lands I sowed salt. Ashurbanipal 647 BC The news of the Assyrian invasion spreads into Zagros. The Elamites go to the kingdom of Somatora and tell them, the Assyrians are coming and there is nothing we can do to protect you. At this point, the last king of Somatora decided to take all his belongings, which he had inherited from his great-grandpa and so on, and hide them inside Kalmakare cave. After the event, after the invasion of the Assyrians, Somatora disappears from history. They don't even come back to retrieve their artifacts. It's possible that the Somatora kingdom, they just ran away. Because when the Assyrian military is approaching, you run. Unless you want your head to be displayed in the central square. It's also possible that the Assyrians got to them and killed them. We don't know. But the objects and the artifacts remained in this cave for the next 2600 years until they were rediscovered by an Iranian shepherd in 1989. According to the Iranian laws, if you discover an ancient treasure, it belongs to the government. It doesn't belong to you and you must submit them immediately. This shepherd, however, he took a little too long to reveal the truth. For about two years, the artifacts of this cave were being sent and sold to other museums in other countries. So many of these artifacts are today in the Museum of Louvre in Paris, Museum of Mihu in Japan, and also other museums like Metropolitan in New York and Metropolitan in Germany. So if you live in the vicinity, go ahead and visit them. Just look for the phrase Kalmakare Cave and now you know what the history was. The Iranian government eventually discovered the truth and they went after the people who had these artifacts and they retrieved the objects and put them back in the Iranian museums. It was a long journey today, four hours of walking back and forth to the Kalmakare cave and then going to the village of Golgol for the Assyrian inscription. And now I feel I need a rest. 
and I found the perfect spot in the village of Golgol in the middle of the flowers. <laughs>